Thank you very much, Ricky. Hello, everybody. It's so good to see everyone here. Um, just going to get situated real quick. Um, so today we're going to be talking about inclusion and how to engage communities. You know, inclusivity is so important to this conversation, but it can be really challenging to engage with critical stakeholders and residents in a way that makes sense for everybody. And I'm incredibly pleased to have the speakers come up today who are going to enlighten us on how to go about doing this. We have Lynn Abramson, president of Clean Energy Business Network, Janie Gonzalez, the CEO of Webhead, Jeffrey Erbach, the Smart City Manager of the City of San Antonio, and Carla Perry, a principal with the Spectrum Group. So if we can give them a round of applause while they come up on stage, that would be excellent. Would you pass one of those mics down? Awesome. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so before we get into all the conversation, I really love to ask this question because I think it really helps clarify the why of why we're here. So, you know, panelists, what makes you so passionate about what you do? Lynn? So I'm the president of the Clean Energy Business Network, which is the small business voice for the clean energy economy. And we work to support opportunities for small and mid-sized companies, as well as entrepreneur support organizations in the clean energy economy through policy, market and technology education, and business development assistance. And what really motivates me is that our organization is not only contributing meaningf meaningful solutions to climate change, but doing so by engaging small businesses, underinvested communities, and others who typically do not have a voice or significant role in policy and market dynamics. So it really feels that we're engaging in a, a very important and underheard voice. Great, thank you. Carla? What really motivates me is I represent small and medium-sized businesses with innovative technologies, and it's helping them bring those technologies to decision makers in the federal government and get grants and get funding and then have them pilot tested and then eventually not only grow as businesses, but provide new and innovative solutions to energy problems. Y'all did a great, ver great version of introducing your passion. Um, mine's a little bit more long-winded than that. Um, my name is Janie Gonzalez. As I said, I'm a founder of Webhead. We've been in the internet business since 1994. So what really drew my passion was that I was raised in a low-income neighborhood, and really my trajectory was to most likely be in a serving industry. So when I had access to the internet, I said, oh my God, this will transform the way we live, work, and play. And for me, it was a great opportunity as a minority who really didn't have a lot of options, even though I was going to college, to create my own opportunity and then to empower not only low-income communities, but to be able to make a profitable business and several generations later, look at what we have today, right? And then I've been able to translate that passion for technology uh, now to also being a public servant, um, a trustee for CPS Energy, and so I'm the first uh, individual to lead a technology and innovation uh, committee, and then I'm gonna be the incoming chair, and my vision is all about digital business transformation and how can we can sincerely make a difference in the communities that we serve by putting more power into people. And so I have a very different view. It's more, it's always been citizen-driven versus tech-driven, even though I'm in the technology industry for 28 years. Local government's the most directly responsive to people. And we're living at a time where this is really a once in a generation opportunity uh, to transform the way that we provide public services to residents. And what drives my passion for this work is, you know, I live in San Antonio, Texas. We are the seventh largest city in the country. We're the second largest city in the state of Texas. We are the fastest growing city in the country. Um, and there's a lot of challenges there. Uh, we, that's right, that's, uh, that's where I was going to get one of those challenges. We are the most impoverished major city in the country. We have very poor health outcomes, some of the highest rates of obesity and diabetes. We live in the most flood prone region in North America. Uh, so there are numerous challenges that we have to manage, uh, but that is where there is far more opportunity than challenge, and, and, and that's what I'm excited to, to work towards. 
Thank you so much. And we're definitely going to be talking about some of the challenges, but we also want to be aspirational. I don't think that we're going to be able to achieve the vision of a limitless city or a smart city unless we strive for more. Um, and with that, so Jeffrey, from you know clean energy to smart city solutions, cities and utilities want to create limitless cities. So what does that vision look like to you? I'll speak about our team's vision, and that's to position uh, San Antonio on the leading edge of digital innovation and in government uh, and provide a seamless experience where all current and future residents are able to thrive, are heard, have opportunity. Uh, and, and if we achieve that vision, then I think we're, we're doing local government right. And you know that can have profound impacts. I'm an optimist. I believe that if you know local government is viewed as something that is helping people and it's not at least negatively impacting their ability to thrive, uh, then maybe we could even, at some level, change some of the political uh, dynamic, uh, at least at the local level. Amazing. Thank you, Janie. Oh, can you repeat the question? Yeah. What is your vision for a limitless city? You know, it's interesting, again, um, having been raised in San Antonio, being a native and being raised in one of the poorest areas of San Antonio and still live in the poorest district, which is 78207, I find it ironic that a lot of what's in now is what I've been fighting for 28 years. And so for me, sometimes as optimistic as I am, because you can't be in business and not take risk and not you know, look to innovation, to problem solve. You're always challenging yourself and, and those who don't have a vision for your own communities. I think the challenge for me always is, and the disappointment has always been, that in many ways we create the same mistakes. We don't keep people, we don't really consider realistically who we're serving. It's often driven by industry, and I'm industry by the way, but I'm talking big tech industry, who often doesn't really care about the end results, they care about introducing their products and services. So I often have the challenge, and I'm a little bit more complex because I don't approach things, you know, I always approach things from a social impact and then I apply the technology. And so I'm always fighting, I feel like I'm always fighting against the current to get people to understand that San Antonio is very diverse and it has a lot of challenges and we can't apply universally the same infrastructure across the board. And so it's about, for me, real simple. It's like, how do we leverage technology for social impact? And then in part of those that really may not care about social impact and that's okay. Maybe for them it's just about consumerism, it's about innovation, it's about the latest, greatest tech and that's okay too. And I think oftentimes, um, you know, we just don't, we're not open or, 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 or considerate that everybody's gonna have a different perspective and that's okay. So for me, I think it's really inclusion is about going through whatever process you need to do to get input, be realistic about it and then apply it differently because not everyone's gonna respond to the perfect roadmap. The roadmap is great for vision, but the reality of implementation is very different and I sometimes wish we were a little bit more realistic about the implementation and I often think that we're quick to move to the next trend and not be consistent with what we want longer term. And so I feel like we waste a lot of money and time by trying to do the greatest, latest thing, especially with tech, it's how it evolves so quickly. So that's just my perspective. Thank you. And I just want to make a note here. Um, there's a lot of representation from the city of San Antonio. What, what? Really happy about that. Um, <laughs> but that was not planned. It, it, just, not uh, it just happened. <laughs> but it's a San Antonio surprise. panel anyways. Um, <laughs> Carla, would love to hear what your vision is um, for a limitless city. I think my vision is um, more transparency. I think over the past 20 years with the internet and, and all of the access to information, it's been available. Now the next step is how to use it, how to communicate better, how to do things more visually, not just uh, you know in writing and speaking in meetings, but how do you show people. And also, I think there's a lot of opportunity to involve more people at the beginning of a process. Yeah. A lot of times we act, ask people to react to something that's drafted or done or an idea, rather than starting off with brainstorming. So I think with technology, we're now able to do a lot more brainstorming with a more diverse group of people more often. Thank you so much. Lynn? 
And I'll just start by saying I'm not from San Antonio. I'm from the, I'm in the DC area, but I do serve on the board of global advisors for Epicenter, which is based in San Antonio. So I've worked a lot with CPS Energy and uh, you know a lot of the folks out there. So shout out to our friends and our board chairman lives out in San Antonio as well. Um, so anyway, in response to the question, um, to me when I think of the word limitless, I think of opportunity. Just you know, allowing each citizen, each community to take maximum advantage of what opportunities might exist. And so when that comes to smart cities and planning decisions, there are so many factors to think about um, from the economic opportunity, so creating a robust local economy that provides job opportunities at every educational level, at every skill set, um, to help source a lot of the talent from an, a local educational pipeline that's very strong, so that involves the K through 12 level as well as higher education. And then in terms of you know thinking about community planning and the cities of the future, you have to think very holistically about where and how people live, work, play, how do you make sure they have access to clean infrastructure such as clean water, um, clean air, green spaces. And so um, that's a very tall order, especially for local governments who are often understaffed and under-resourced. Um, so I think being smart about all of that planning is trying to engage the communities, engaging the different voices within the communities. And I really appreciate how Carla kind of emphasized that each person within a community and each community is unique in its needs and long-term goal. So thinking about that comprehensively. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, from my perspective, you know, Limitless Cities is all about accessibility, right? Like we're talking about access to services, we're talking about access to utilities that are, you know, critical for survival. We're talking about transportation and mobility opportunities as well. Um, and I think that we're all here because we want to fight for the same things. And I'm really glad that we get to have this conversation as such. Um, we will be opening it up for questions here in about 20 minutes, so be thinking about it because I will call on you and we will look for engagement. Um, so we are talking about engagement, so communication and engagement is crucial for overall success when we're talking about these initiatives. So what strategies do you find work best when engaging with residents and customers? Uh, Carla. I think it's a mixed bag. I think you can't have a single approach um, I often think, uh, like I said, it's involving people at the beginning of the process. In order to do that, you have to have meetings, you, wherever they may be. Uh, you know, if you're in an underserved community, you're probably not participating in a web chat session. So you have to think through what you want to accomplish, what the issue is, and again, meet people where they are. But you also have to develop relationships with people that have access to others in the community. You have to have a bigger group speaking for you. And if you can do that, I think you'll be successful. Great, thank you. Janie? She pretty much nailed it, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree, I, I think what has always worked for me is being an authentic leader. I think being humble, being honest, and even accepting that we, we messed up. As simple as, I'm sorry, goes a long way uh, in communication. And so that's always been my approach, to be very honest. I actually get in trouble a lot at I shouldn't say CPS, because I am so used to just talking to people, being around people, and I sometimes forget that a lot of times everything's so sometimes prepared and, you know, legal and compliance, and so it, it sometimes can be a challenging when I'm just used to just being one with just individuals, and so, but but to, to reiterate what she said, I mean, again, communication is key, uh, being authentic is key, knowing that not everyone's gonna appreciate what you have to ha say, not take it personal, know that maybe you, you have to, again, I, I do believe that one of the key components is uh, engaging other groups. You know, I grew up going back and forth in, with two borders, United States and Mexico, so like a uh, very old methodology is uh, what we call empresarios, or uh, not empresarios, but, um, how we, they're individuals that basically go into the homes, right? That tactic really is what still is applied today. Sometimes an HOA or a nonprofit group has to be that conduit. And so having those partnerships are important and identifying new partnerships. Because I can tell you, you know, historically, uh, the organization that I represent, we get the same people complaining or praising us. Mm -hmm. I would like to see different people. And so that means that we have to go above and beyond and identify new groups so that we can firm up that ecosystem of the right voices or new perspectives. Because oftentimes it's the same thing over and over and over. And it's like, okay, 
but what's the new what's the new content? What what are we going to create? How are we going to work together in a different capacity? Because there's only so many times we can say the same thing over and over, mm -hmm. and it goes back to the earlier um, presenter. We're in a weird space right now with the way social media is and the way the media and the way they, the younger generations use it. A lot of misinformation, a lot of content, maybe a lot, too much content. So what's, how do we filter all of that and still have the right message and, and then have the right partnerships? Not so that you can say what I want, but so that you can reiterate the positive things about what we're trying to accomplish, because it really should be about that. If I talk about 10 things and you don't agree with me on five, please at least support me for the five things you do agree with me, and I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. So I do think that we need to be a little bit more open to working together, even if we come from different perspectives, because diversity in thought is very important in order for us to make a social impact in all areas, whether it's economic development, affordable housing, sustainability, and so it's okay that we don't agree. Let's just respect each other and, and, and advocate for each other in whatever capacities that we can agree on. Thank you. Jeffrey. Well, Carla and Janie, both spot on, uh, and how that applies to us, meet people where they're at, uh, engage them early in the process, be absolutely transparent, with the public, but you know the, the title of this session is very apt, how to engage communities. We don't view San Antonio as just a community. There are many communities out there. We're unique because we have uh, something developed in San Antonio called an equity atlas. Few cities around the country have this. It helped guide our work in terms of how we performed our outreach into the community, which is ongoing. It's not just you do community engagement and stop for a while, create a plan. Uh, we're working on a smart city roadmap we'll be releasing in the spring and we've done nine to 12 months of stakeholder engagement prior to even writing this thing. And that has been surveys to our employees, surveys out to residents, but not only surveys. We've held over 30 community events. We use the Equity Atlas to prioritize underserved communities and make sure that we're popping up in those areas. We had kiosks out there meeting people where they're at. Hey, maybe you can't make it to a community meeting, but you can access a kiosk on your own time and, and provide that feedback. So, you know, that's a constant challenge is how do you truly get that representative voice of your community? Uh, it means a lot to different people. It's not just residents, but, you know, the people that work at businesses there are also part of the community. The people that work for our city are also part of our community. So how do we match capacity uh, with real needs? And so we're really excited about all the work that, that we, put into this roadmap and, and we'll be sharing in the spring of how we've connected those needs to, uh, to real projects and challenges uh, that we can solve for our communities. Thank you so much. Lynn? Yeah, so I think my perspective on this is a little bit unique because um, unlike Janie and Jeffrey who are working very closely with their local community and like Carlo who's got some clients that are local communities, our community is about 7,500 small business leaders and organizations across the nation. So very different points of view and needs in, in some of those constituencies. Um, but a lot of the work we have done is, as a subcontractor through the Department of Energy's uh, American Main Challenges Program, we serve as a power connector to help recruit and support applicants to various DOE funding opportunities. And lately we're seeing a lot of these funding opportunities coming out uh, to actually go directly to community organizations to help them implement their local economic development or environmental justice or energy justice goals. And so we've had the opportunity opportunity to be kind of having a you know front row seat to really creative community based strategies for engaging communities and one of the um, areas of common ground i see in successful projects to do this is that sort of two-way street, that dialogue. Um, and I want to borrow that term that Janie said, uh, humble leadership. I really like that. And I, I think it's sort of like thinking if you're the CEO of a business, you need to ultimately make decisions. But if you're not listening to your staff and engaging their expertise, why do you have them? So some of the most successful projects we're seeing is where they're really inviting the um, local residents and a typically, you know, the average person is not going to have time to participate in a whole bunch of town halls and things. So if you're kind of going to the source, going to local leadership, you know, the churches, the rotary clubs, the local utility leadership, local government leadership, um, you know, chambers of commerce, economic development agencies, 
inviting them to be part of the discussion. Um, and you know, I think Jeffrey kind of talked about authenticity, authentically communicating what are our challenges, what are our goals, what are our limitations, what kind of budgets are available, you know, what are some regulations that we are forced to adhere to, you know, what are the limits, right? And um, and then kind of collectively developing those solutions. So I, unsuccessful projects are when a packaged project comes down the road and is delivered to the community that hasn't been part of shaping it. So I think really engaging community leaders from the start is gonna be key to the ultimate success. And ultimately, they may not, everyone may not be happy or agree with every aspect of a project, but you'll get a lot more buy-in and probably a much more robust and creative project. Absolutely, thank you so much. And I think touching on, you know, what doesn't work. Um, I, <laughs> we're, we're trying to be aspirational, we do wanna talk about challenges, but there are times that things fail. And I think it can be really difficult for community stakeholders, civic leaders, as well as people in industry um, who roll out some of these massive projects that maybe potentially don't take off. And so communicating what you want to achieve in a positive light is really critical and important, but also being able to you know, deal with the failures that could potentially come from innovative technologies being applied in, you know, at scale in your community um, is a real challenge and exciting but um, definitely requires a lot of intention and thought when you're meeting people and owning up to what is happening. Um, we've kind of touched a little bit on this with disparate you know, individuals in the communities or people who are underserved. Um, so equity and accessibility are definitely top of mind for people who are rolling out smart city initiatives. Um, and we don't wanna leave anyone out of the conversation um, and no, nor do we really wanna place like climate and civic burdens on you know, groups that have historically experienced those burdens. So with that, how do we sort of bridge some of these gaps? And we talked about strategies overall to engage communities, but what do we really need to kind of have top of mind to address these equity and accessibility issues? Jeffrey, would you like to take us off? I mean, I go back to, to building on the current equity atlas and making sure that that is institutionalized and how our departments are making decisions about projects. Uh, it's, it's open data, so even the general public can look at that and understand you know, what the city's trying to do, how we're trying to tackle some of these issues. Uh, in, in terms of just getting folks engaged and some of the challenges around that engagement to begin with, I mean, Lynn, you made a great point. Like, people are focused on paying their bills, like taking care of their families. So to get them to come out to a community meeting uh, and spend their time uh, outside of, of those key needs is, is really difficult. Uh, so, you know, there's a number of areas that we can improve in. You know, one that, that we talk about on our team is, honestly, we should probably have a city that supports childcare at these community events so more people can come so that we can have more participation in general. We've looked at putting QR codes on public infrastructure. Again, another meet people where they're at, get information about projects we're gonna launch in advance or during projects uh, and, and being as transparent as possible uh, to really improve trust with the public which absolutely includes writing about our failures, talking about it just as much as our success because that is how you innovate in government. You're, you're gonna fail from time to time, but how we learn from those failures can honestly result in better outcomes down, down the road. But we can't get there unless we have that, that opportunity. Absolutely, thank you. Carla? I think you said a lot of really good things, but I think what's challenging is explaining to people how you use their information. I, I don't know that people really get, even when you meet with them, what you've done to take that into account and how you've applied it. And so I think that whole process of explaining things better to people, not just from failures and successes, but again, what are you doing next week? What are, what are you doing six months from now? I also find that when you have public meetings, it's a lot of the same people, as you've all said, tend to go to those, right? So they're the people that have the time, but they also speak the loudest. And oftentimes it's hard to engage if that's not, you know, where you're coming from. So, uh, but it's that, it's that application. You're, you're taking input, but how does that really, how do you communicate to people you've used it? How do you really show them? And I don't have the answer to that. But. It's, a, it's a great point. It's a huge challenge. And you know, we're looking at ways where to, to put together a website, which just sounds like a website, but how do you activate a forum that 
anyone can access? How can we be transparent, build feedback loops with the public so that, hey, when you provided our input at a survey, this is how we directly responded. This is the project we launched. This is what we did. What are your thoughts? Exactly. And, you know, continue to build that relationship and not just a one time, you know, well, you didn't do anything with my feedback. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Lynn? Yeah, so um, I think some of the dialogue just now between Jeffrey and Carla reflects the fact that everyone has at some point engaged with their local government in some capacity to request a permit, to file taxes, you know, pay an assessment fee, et cetera. And um, everyone has probably had at least one bad experience with their local government. So think about that and try not to do that, <laughs> which is easier said than done. But you know, I know I personally have experienced things with confusing websites, forms, et cetera. Um, but I want to go back to some of the things I raised earlier with respect to some of the projects we've seen through our engagement with the Department of Energy, um, which is not as much on the implementation of projects, but the design of them. And we have an enormous opportunity right now. Um, so I you know, work a lot with the federal side of things and um, just some of the recent climate and clean energy legislation that has been enacted in the past year is going to be pumping about half a billion dollars in investment into our economy. And that's only, that's going to be further magnified by private sector investments that will be further leveraged by loan authority, tax credits, um, grants, et cetera. So, you know, we've been working on a really resource constrained environment in, in the clean energy and climate space for a long time. And the resources are there. Um, and then there also is this Justice 40 commitment or Justice 40 initiative from the Biden administration, which is a goal of making sure that 40% of clean energy and climate investments are made in disadvantaged communities. So this sounds great. A lot of money is going to be thrown at disadvantaged communities, but do they know what to do with it when they haven't had the capacity put in place for many, many decades in order to take advantage of those resources. Um, so I think this is a critically important and urgent question because there's a lot of pressure to get those funds out the door quickly. And so I think one of the most important things we need to do right now is build local capacity. That means investing in multi-year contracts with HBCUs, MSIs, local economic development organizations, community organizations to build technical assistance locally um, to actually actively educate and recruit people into the clean energy workforce. Um, and that means at all levels from you know, entry level jobs to business ownership and wealth creation opportunities. And um, I want to, I can't take credit for this idea. I've had some recent conversations with a colleague, Sarita Turner at um, Prosperity Now, and I think one of the ways she's put this so eloquently is that there's a huge danger that with this Justice 40 initiative, if we don't get it right, that outside project developers, firms, et cetera, will come in, build projects in a local community, and then leave, taking that wealth with them. So how do we build longevity? How do we engage communities from the start in the new economic opportunities coming out of clean energy? And that's something really important. But the good news is that we are seeing a lot more resources in this area. So I mentioned some of these, these federal resources. There's a lot of money coming out of the Department of Energy. Um, we've been supporting prizes such as the Inclusive Energy Innovation Prize. There's 18 amazing teams selected out of more than 200 amazing applicants to implement community-based projects around the country. Next week, DOE will be announcing winners of the Community Coalition Prize. Um, meanwhile, the EPA, just on the 10th, I believe, of January, announced more than $100 million in grant opportunities for environmental justice projects in communities. So we really want to get the word out to those who are in positions of influence in communities to take advantage of those resources and build that local capacity. Amazing. Thank you so much. Janie. Can you repeat the question? Because it kind of... Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. So we were talking about... I'm writing yes to everything because I love it, but... <laughs> no, it's... My thoughts. <laughs> the importance that. of equity and accessibility, right, and making sure that we reach disparate communities and that we set things up in such a way that they're not left out um, in the future that we build. Well, I mean, I, I think that the aim should be always, right, in building a smart city, that we put this, the needs again of citizens first, right, and that they feel that they're actually 
again, part of that process and that they get to actually see some of their work in it, right? The output needs to be something meaningful. Um, you know, and all of you touched already a lot of what I would have said, you know, again, and, and I don't like to use the word, we, we, I hear it so much about transparency, because I don't really think that we're not transparent. Uh, I think that we, we put information on the website, we put it on social media, we do a press release. So is it really about being transparent? I often think that it's not really about what, we don't have to do more about transparency. I think that we lack selling the value proposition. How does this benefit my community? How does this benefit me when I'm making $7.25 and you're gonna pump all this money in 78207, which is the poorest city of San Antonio that already has environmental issues, right, and equities. So what good does it do for Google to open up or give me free cloud? How do I really truly improve the quality of my life? And the quality of life for people is simple. No one wants to make $7.25. And I think often, what I've seen at least in San Antonio, and I always tell people, is that we don't do a very good job, I, I don't think we have historically in San Antonio, which is pay people because we're a city that rewards people for getting educated, or we reward people for getting out of poverty. We do more punishing people for being in poverty and for not maybe entering in the careers that they should or do or respond in the way they should. So until we as government choose to honor people's individuality and respect people for who they are or celebrate the people from San Antonio versus constantly always just be recruiting and the next transplant is the best thing since cream cheese versus the person that was born in the South Side who has grown up to be this chairwoman now and yet somehow when now you've worked your way out of poverty, you build a business, you pay your taxes, you're not in a position of leadership, and then society reminds you that you're still not good enough. So, I mean, I see a lot of this pattern over and over. So is it really about the money that we invest? Or is it really about respecting people for who they are and, and, be, and really acknowledge that we have a lot of disparities and you cannot overdo them with each administration because they've been in place for decades. This is not something that happened 200 years, you know, or more. So then how are we realistic about when we get new money and maybe it's better not to do the latest greatest. Maybe it's just good to just do enough. Let people get acclimated to enough, empower them and know it may take somebody two to three years to get to the point where we want that citizen, whereas someone in a higher income area gets it overnight. Mm -hmm. See, and I think that that's always the challenge with money or approaches. We want everybody, just because we invest $40 million or $20 million in a community that really has been deprived for generations, you can't expect them to undo the way you've been, uh, how do I say that? You've been marginalized overnight. Mm. That makes sense. I, yeah, Jeffrey, do you want to... I just I, re I really appreciate Janie's perspective on this, and this is not unique to San our Antonio. city in San Antonio. This is cities all across the country. You know, going back to my uh, initial comments on the generational opportunity that we have in front of us, it's how do we change that narrative? Right. And there are technologies available to help get us there. There is also just simple actions that, can, that, that we can take to get us there. Uh, I'm inspired by a lot of the work that's happening in DC. This is the city that inspired my passion for smart cities. I spent six years here and you know the, the local government did something called Formapalooza. They just looked at government forms and, and goes, this is terrible. Let's change it, let's update it, let's make it easier for people, let's make it accessible for everyone. Uh, and the project that inspires me the most in, in, the, in light of community engagements, the 11th Street Bridge Park project, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that project, but you had developers go to the community, Anacostia, one of the most low-income, underserved communities in Washington, which has been disconnected from a lot of opportunities by the Anacostia River, and developers wanted to build a bridge. And they didn't come with a plan that this is the bridge, is what we're doing, we're just gonna put it down here, but they went to the community first, held a ton of meetings. This project has been in conversation for many, many years. It is still yet to be built, but it is getting close now, I believe. And they developed a community uh, land trust so that 
residents in Anacostia own the land and they can make the decision over whether their apartment complex is sold to developers or not. Uh, they had input into the plans and now it's a educational park. There are all sorts of you know cultural aspects to what the bridge will look like and I think that's the responsible way to go about development is approach the community first because now when all those property values rise in Anacostia the residents that community is going to have the opportunity to take advantage of that generational wealth that'll be developed and, and that's really exciting. Thank you so much. I think you know we've kind of touched on this a little bit but you know to put a pin on this Balancing the needs of right now in our communities and investing in the future can oftentimes be conflicting issues, right? Um, and it can be really hard to communicate the value or the benefit of investing right now in something that's not fully going to come to fruition for maybe 10, 15 years. And when you're talking about city infrastructure, you're talking about legacy infrastructure. It's going to last for potentially decades. And so really getting engaged and getting involved with the people who are going to potentially be most impacted by this in raising up those communities so that way we build better systems, better infrastructure moving forward is the aspiration, but the challenges does exist. And well, how, I don't even have streetlights in my neighborhood. Why are you talking about making them intelligent? I don't have sidewalks. I don't have access to consistent transportation. I don't have affordable, you know, um, childcare where I don't have, you know, a good paying job, like why aren't we doing these things first? And so I have to commend people who are working in futuristic, innovative sort of realms because we are addressing those needs at the same time. Um, I have one more question, which is just like really quick final thoughts, because I do want to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, we have wonderful people here who are brilliant, who have really great questions, I'm sure. So with that, Lynn, could you just wrap up final thoughts? I think um, what you just said, all of the above, I think the most successful projects for engaging with communities take into account all of these needs and take into account that each family is going to have a whole variety of needs that they're trying to meet. And so, you know, it's hard when you have multiple goals because you can't do everything perfectly, but when you're at least aware of the multiple goals and taking them into account and trying to plan effectively around all of them, you're gonna do a much better job. Great, thank you, Carla. My final thought is I liked what Lynn said about building capacity. Um, you know, you really have to help people get that technical grounding. And with all of the federal funds coming that are going to be, you know, capitalized investments by the private sector with other federal funds and other grant programs, as you said, it's really important, again, not only to explain to people what's happening, but to show them how you're using that money and how you're making the decisions about how to spend it. And how, as you said, it's over a period of years. It's, it's not next week. Not. And that's critical. Yeah. Again, great, great feedback from both of them. I, I think that the only thing I can add that we didn't have time is also explaining, you know, data rights, you know, the security of the data that we're collecting. And then with all that data, how do we use data to make good decisions when you know something's not working? I think oftentimes we start a path and we refuse to be agile in it. And I think that one of the challenges for me coming from private where today I can say blue, tomorrow I say green, uh, I work in representing the other organization takes three years sometimes to make a change. And I think that one of the opportunities for those of you who represent government is be more agile in your decision making because you have the luxury of working for government who usually has guaranteed funding, whereas citizens and private sector, you know, small businesses don't. And so you need to be more agile in how you implement and also change in how you interpret data if you really want to see true success. If you still have the mentality of, well, we're a bureaucracy, we have to go through all these other things, hey, we're not going to get the results that we want. You may get the money, but you're not going to get the social impact, and then we're going to always have the same two two rows. The people who are complaining about having a, uh, you know, pay for everybody's social services, and then the people who want social services. Mm -hmm. So that's always going to continue to be the battle if we're not more agile in our approach to problem solving and implementing smart cities. Thank you, and Jeffrey. 
Two quick thoughts. Uh, so as I have mentioned a few times now, we're going to be putting out our Smart City Roadmap this spring. We're going to have uh, a series of challenges that came about through what we've heard from our community and the capacity we have within the city. Uh, so we're really excited about that. Follow us on Twitter at InnovateSA for updates. Uh, and then lastly, just a call to action to all of you, public sector, private sector, academia, San Antonio is where it's at. We've got, uh, we got, we got a hell of a lot of exciting things going on in this city. Uh, and so please get in touch with us. Help us become the city of the future. And uh, yeah, thank you. Amazing. Okay, so now it's your turn. Um, who's got a question for our wonderful panelists? Yes, sir. Yes, so San Antonio is doing a lot of work on mitigating the vulnerability of the grid to attack and cyber attacks. What are you doing about microgrids and this idea of uh, disadvantaged communities and making them self-sustaining? I can't go into full, full, <laughs> full disclosure because there's a lot of technologies that we're exploring. Uh, one of our priorities, we, we managed to recently get a uh, budget approved um, that would allow us to do more in disadvantaged communities and improving the lack of infrastructure. So with microgrids, uh, one of our priorities is really exploring more how we can use community solar as a priority. Uh, we've just had a lot of, it's been really busy at CPS. <laughs> Everything from, I, I mean, I started in 2019 and I went straight into the battle of Rate, uh, the climate action plan. Then I got stuck with implementing the rate advisory committee. Then I got stuck in navigating the entire organization <laughs> through Winter Yuri and then a new CEO all in three years. And we just got that approved. So a lot of our projects are in, in some shape or form in some capacity, but not ready. So as the incoming chair, I have, I'm gonna be working with our new CEO to prioritize how we're going to implement digital transformation to modernize the grid, right? And so one of that will be how do we explore more and how do we effectively use microgrids in the inner city and low-income communities uh, and have a different approach, right, a different flavor for it. And so I can't go more into details because a lot of it is still we're, we're exploring how we're going to best implement that because we're in the early stages of, of rolling out our plan that frankly was delayed by three years with everything I just kind of rolled out, no different than the city of San Antonio. We're trying to get projects out as fast as possible, but I think that particular project, that approach needs a little bit more, more critical thinking about how we're gonna be able to do that right for the communities that we serve. I know that's long-winded to basically tell you nothing you wanna hear, but, <laughs> but it's the truth. Thank you so much. Do we have another question? Yes, sir. Thank you, hey, John Gaffigan here on behalf of Leaders in Energy and also an outsourced uh, resource for emerging tech companies. Um, taking some of what Frank had said in the prior session and the session here, I think one of the key themes that you have to thread through all this is a concept of ROI and relevance. So he talked about the relevance, right? Because if it's not something you can personalize in your own home, in your own community, it's not likely going to get adopted or you're not going to get widespread um, uh, buy-in, right, for the broader community. And I think also people are very hedgy about, you know, there's a lot of divides. I mean, we're kind of in the midst of a civil war in America that we're not really talking about. But I think the way that you come at, at a third rail approach that doesn't burn everybody is this era of incredible transparency. And we really, frankly, I don't think do a good job with that. What I'd like to do, maybe you can talk to some of this, is the ROI element of these things. I think it's really a, a getting... Um, evident, right, as far as like these green technology and solutions. And I think the more adoption that we have of this stuff and the more that shows that we're not squandering public trust money, using it wisely, I think that element of ROI needs to be baked into all this discussion about transformation because I think that's going to broaden the adoption of, uh, of buy-in. So that's my comment. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Um, do we have, we have two minutes left. Do we have one more question for our panelists? Oh, great. There's a... Is that Hala? It is. It is. I'm, I'm taking the risk of maybe the question been answered because I walked in late. Uh, so excuse me if I do that. Um, this is Hala, electric power engineers. Did, did we, what are the top things that are value add to disadvantaged communities in terms of grid 
renewables, digitization. Are we even there yet? Do we really know? Lynn, do you want to? So I think if you try to come the, with the top things for all communities across the board, it's going to look like a really different list. Um, but you know, I think to John's point, 100%, and I, and I think this kind of was echoed throughout the panel, meeting communities where they're at, um, which means understanding what are the priorities of local residents. So um, you know, if you're going into an area with older homes that are leaking, you know, air, very in energy efficient, energy inefficient, um, upgrading those older homes, it, this is not necessarily the latest and greatest technology, but can make a huge difference on the local greenhouse gas footprint, but more importantly, on utility bills for those customers. Safety. Right, and safety. Um, you know, it could be resilience in a flood prone community or earthquake or you know other natural disaster prone it could be uh, creating new opportunities for economic growth and jobs so it really um, varies I think from community to community yeah I mean it's true I mean each each community is is going to have priorities for themselves right and, and like in San Antonio we have districts right so it's district one two three four five six you know eight nine ten and I think we're going to add another one or two um, the point is is like each community is going to have people naturally will migrate to a community that resonates with them and so therefore it's a lot easier I think sometimes to be able to arrive at that conclusion of what their priorities are faster believe it or not than a newer community, right? But I think what we're seeing is with gentrification now, there's a big shift in making priorities for those individuals that are moving in that are most active. And so I think that we gotta be very careful to balance those out, those individuals who, who think differently and have different expectations and those that don't. And we can't devalue that someone in 78207, it's really about something as basic as, um, I want to be able to feed my children, right? I want to be able to walk into the HEB, one of the biggest you know, grocery stores in San Antonio. I want to be able to walk in and have healthy food for my children, you know? And, and sometimes not even that is accomplished. What you learn by going to different stores, grocery stores throughout the city of San Antonio, is that some stores, based on data, will have higher price or healthier food than if you go into the inner city, right? So are we really doing the right things? Or are we just doing the things that make us profit, right? So how do we balance the fact that we're in the we, we got to make money, but how do we balance the priorities of communities with also doing right what they can afford, right? We want to introduce new priorities, but we also want to take their priorities, right? It's back to a hybrid approach. I think is always the best way um, to to meet the needs of a diverse community, right? Some woman needs 5G, the other person just wants to have access to Wi-Fi. You know, someone wants an iPad, someone just wants, a, a, you know, the latest iPad, someone wants a used iPad, you know? It's that simple. You know, it's again, just really basic things uh, and being able to take inventory of the assets of the community, both good and bad, and then be able to prioritize how we roll out solutions and services for those individuals and then tweak them as needed and use data to do so. Thank you so much. Well, we are out of time. Can we please get a round of applause for our uh, panelists? There are networking opportunities and I know...